All right, listen, I got my cup of coffee here. I hope you do too. And I hope that you are ready because you're about to walk into a beautiful keynote with a brilliant president who is about to drop even more gems. So without further ado, I'm getting ready to introduce to you two brilliant people that I really admire. Of course, the wonderful Mark Sassman, editor and publisher of the Willamette Week. Mark is a powerhouse. He is a thinker. He is thoughtful. Okay, he's a thinker who's thoughtful. I cannot wait to hear his interview questions. He always brings lots of great um Lots of great expertise from his own lived experience, but then also tries to pull that out, both personal and professional, from the people he interviews. So you're going to get a real treat here. Get ready to share those gems uh, with uh, the wonderful, the brilliant, the powerhouse, Tammy Newcomb, president of Tektronix. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the boss. Mark, have a great chat. Good morning, Everybody, uh, thank you, Paige. That was awfully nice. Um, uh, here we are in a bright and early morning, at least in Portland. Uh, I am particularly delighted to be here this morning with uh, Tammy Newcomb. And it's not just because she's the president of uh, one of the larger employers uh, in Oregon, Tektronix. Um, and it's not just because Tektronix, which has stumbled a little bit in the past, appears to be on the rebound and we want to talk to Tammy about why that's so, but also because if you live in the Northwest, um, you should know that Tektronix is a storied legendary company. It is in fact, the reason why there is a Silicon forest, uh, in the state of Oregon. It is the original tech company. It was created in 1946. I frankly think there are only a handful of tech companies in America that are older. I think a uh, General Electric and IBM may be a handful and maybe Hewlett Packard. Um, uh, but also because uh, this was a company that was created right after World War II by a couple of Oregonians, became a world-class leader, was the largest employer of the state, created uh, some enormous fortunes which benefit the state to this day. Um, uh, the philanthropy generated by uh, wealth created by Tektronix benefits Oregon to this state, but also because Tektronix, unlike a lot of other tech companies, was really an extraordinary incubator. Um, this state is um, filled with companies that had their uh, roots in tech, either because the company was started at Tech Labs and spun off because employees were given the freedom to work on their own projects. Um, and so it is in many respects, the original accelerator. So with far too long of a prelude, um, that's why I'm particularly excited, Tammy, to have you here with us this morning. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, I appreciate the kind words as do the employees of Tektronix and the recognition of the, the history that Tektronix has had in the community. Glad to be here with you. Thank you, Tammy. You know, I wanted to start by uh, having you talk a little bit about yourself because um, you've obviously had a very impressive re resume. You've been working for Fortune 500 companies for quite a bit of time, um, uh, but you have a somewhat atypical background. I mean, you are a very small town girl. You grew up in Lafayette, New York, which I'm familiar with, which <laughs> has a population of what? Is Does it have 4,000 people? And I'm we got a stoplight. I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about your uh, about your uh, your upbringing. Sure, Mark. I know. Uh, I think we crossed paths a bit in the Syracuse area as I was getting to know you. But I uh, grew up in upstate New York. Uh, love sports and love technology. Even at an early age, my uh, my dad was an industrial arts teacher back when uh, technology was a part of the curriculum and got the opportunity to put those two things together at Syracuse University, where I got to play volleyball and get a, a double E. Uh, from there, I've just uh, been blessed to have a, a wonderful career. I've gotten to live in four or five different parts of, of the country. I've had several global jobs across engineering, operations, marketing, and uh, last two decades really spent my time in sales. And um, elevated to the president of tech about a little bit more than uh, a year ago, or has it been two years? Coming up on two years. 
So um, for those of you who don't know, tech is largely in the business of making devices that test and measure. So if you're an average person, you probably don't own a Tektronix oscilloscope. But if you're in the business of testing and measuring, Tektronix is as well known a brand as Nike or Columbia to people who buy shoes or, 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 or out, outer coats. Is, is that a fair assessment of Tektronix? It's fair. I think of, uh, you know, the, the innovators, the entrepreneurs, many of which are electrical engineers, scientists, uh, they know the tech brand. I, I knew it uh, as an electrical engineer at the university. And it's an instrument that helps you see signals, much like a DVR for your TV records uh, TV shows that you can play back. Tektronix has mastered how to record signals, electrical signals that you can't see with your eye and be able to play those back and analyze those to basically develop almost every piece of electronics that you could find anywhere on the globe, whether it's a, you know, a satellite that goes off into space, it's a, an autonomous vehicle, um, or the tiniest of sensors. Uh, all behind that, besides the smart innovators and engineers that uh, bring those products to life is Tektronics equipment. So. Uh, and I would assume that the space itself has grown. It seems like we have the ability to test and measure things that we couldn't five or 10 years ago. So if, if the market, if you will, has grown, talk a little bit about why tech stumbled in the past and why it appears to be on the rebound. Well, thanks for the, uh, the call out on the rebound. Uh, it's been a it's been a tough year, you know, across the globe with the uh, the pandemic, and uh, with that, I am still very very pleased with Tektronix results this year, and expect that we'll continue to build on that in 21 and in 22 and beyond. Uh, you use the word stumble, and um, I think I, I think I bring a perspective into into Tektronix and Fortif, uh, our parent company, I, I come from the technology world and it's, it's very rare. I think even called this out in the opening that a company is around for 75 years. And uh, I looked up a stat the other day in the time frame that Tektronix was born. If you were to look at the Fortune 500, 89% of those companies are gone. Um, so just the fact that tech is still thriving as a technology company uh, in Oregon, uh, in Portland, or actually in Beaverton, uh, is, is just a, a testament to the many presidents before me and the people before me that have been able to reinvent and recreate this company. Um, there has been tough years. There's been tough decades, but the, the company has been able to figure that out and uh, right the ship and... Uh, I couldn't be happier to work with the people and the culture that's here at this company. So where is the opportunity for tech? What, what, what are the areas where there's just great opportunity to develop new business? Yeah, I get excited, um, and Mark, you've been in technology a long time, but I get excited about uh, some of the, the um, wireless capacity that's coming online. Uh, right now it's called 5G, there'll be a 6G and a 7G down the road. But if you think about 5G, I, I got my phone right here. We often think it's just so that our phones work better. But what's happening with 5G is the, the bandwidth and the speed is large enough to enable trillions of dollars of value in all kinds of devices. And in interesting places like agriculture, where we're seeing sensors being rototilled into the ground and drones monitoring crops for fertilizer and water and just getting massive productivity. You're seeing the, the capability of these new communications through 5G where the world becomes really flat as to where people can work. And you can have this great video, this rich interaction like you and I are having from any place around the globe uh, yesterday at, at your event, um, we had innovators talking about how to uh, bring quality of life 
um, to people of all ages, a lot of that is through technology. So not only does Tektronics have a play in the, um, the 5G networks themselves in testing, but all this proliferation of devices from automotive to um, anything that you're connecting, even within a, in a factory, they're connecting everything. So communications is huge. The second area I'd talk about big opportunity for Tektronix is around power. And there's two, two ends of it. There's the power where, you know, my mom's hearing aids have to last hours and hours or days. Um, so really long power life that we, that, that smart people are trying to get um, to the other end of the spectrum, which is um, electrification of um, uh, tractor trailers and cars and buses and everything else. And Tektronix fits squarely in that space. We acquired a company back in 2011, Keithley Instruments, and just uh, masterful in that area of power. And then the third place that I, I find exciting is just simplifying things. You know, we have hundreds of thousands of new engineers, scientists, innovators coming into the market every year, and uh, they want instruments to work like your iPhone. They want to touch and, and you know, open things. Uh, they want virtual reality, uh, be able to do things through goggles. Uh, they want uh, collaboration through the cloud. We just announced uh, in the last couple of weeks two new offerings that are cloud offerings from Tektronix to allow people to collaborate all over the globe um, with the data you get off the instruments. So tons of great opportunity for Tektronix. You have talked in the past about you viewing one of your mandates as building a culture of futurists. Yeah. Um, on the one hand, I understand exactly what that means. And on the other hand, I don't, I don't get it at all. So what do you mean <laughs> and how do you do it? Yeah, yeah. Um, innovators. That's what I think of when I think of futurists. And uh, two, two things I'd highlight. The first is how, how do you create a culture where people are willing to fail? And that's, that's hard. You know, we hire bright people, we hire a lot of engineers, people who have been very, very successful. Um, how do you allow people in the culture? How do you celebrate failure, fast failure? And um, you look at the stats of startup companies, right? It's one in 10 or one in 100 um, that, that hit each milestone. And that's the way we're looking at it. Like we've got to fail at a lot of things really quickly within weeks or months uh, to be able to find those really innovative, great new ideas. And we get most of our learnings from the failures. So that's that's the number one piece. And if, if you were on one of our um, growth board calls, Mark, uh, when a team comes forward and they say, say we've done the market work, um, we've talked to customers, we just don't think there's enough value here, or this isn't their biggest problem to solve, we think we should kill this idea, uh, they get a round of applause. We, we clap, we cheer for them that uh, they've decided to kill that and move on to something bigger. The second thing you need to uh, create this environment of innovation and these futurists is a process. And uh, we are a part of Fortiv and Fortiv is known for the Fortiv business systems. And they have a business process that we have implemented within Tektronix that actually helps us with the ideation funnel and in through the several gates that we have in the dream phase before we initiate a program into development. So I think it's, it's a culture of celebrating failure um, combined with a really strong process orientation that uh, again, it's a, it's a benefit of being a part of Fortiv. So Tammy, your um, major operation is in Beaverton. You have several thousand employees there. Um, I, I think you do have some smaller satellites elsewhere in the country, but Beaverton really is, you know, home. Um, what are the relative advantages and disadvantages of, uh, of operating in Oregon, either in terms of attracting talent, competing for talent, the regulatory environment, um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I was uh, I was thinking through your question, Mark. Uh, first of all, uh, I uh, I love I love Oregon. Um, I was thinking of I was kind of starting with the what's the downside. I think the downside for me is I've fallen in love with micro um, beers and breweries and uh, have to uh, and all the great food <laughs> that, that's in Portland. So uh, I, I guess for me, that's a little bit of a downside because I'm not looking to put on some extra pounds at this point in my life. Uh, but let me talk about some of the amazing things, um, just the culture. Now, and I don't mean just the culture of tech, the whole the culture of uh, the Beaverton, Portland area, it's very vibrant. Uh, there, uh, a lot of outdoor enthusiasts, uh, a community of people who want to give back. And, uh, and, and you know, luckily for Tektronix, uh, a wealth of talent. Uh, lots of technology companies and uh, really strong talent in the, in the local market. We've also been able to partner with many of the local colleges and universities. Um, we've got both general management tracks that uh, we bring people in and rotate them through the different parts of Tektronix and Fortive to become general managers. Uh, we also uh, have co-op programs and uh, engineering programs uh, in the local community. And I, and I should call out our finance program is very strong with rotations uh, throughout the company. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a fantastic place to be headquartered. Uh, we are a global company. So about half the company is outside of the United States. And uh, we, do, we do a lot in those local communities also. But even in the pandemic, this is an environment in which um, tech growth has been substantial and the competition for talent is extraordinary. If yes. you're a good engineer or if you've got a background in artificial intelligence. So how, how do you compete? You know, Amazon is a good example. Amazon, um, in addition to its warehouse, I mean, in downtown Portland, between Amazon and Elemental, they've got several thousand people. They supposedly pay off the charts. <laughs> um, how, how do you, how do you, and obviously it's a global brand. How do you compete, given that clearly you're putting so much emphasis as president in investing in good people? What, what, what's the case you make? You know, I think a lot about, I, I started my career as an engineer. Um, I think a lot about reasons that I took jobs or worked for companies and front and center is the people I got to work with. Um, who did I work for as a, the leadership team and who was to my left and right? And did they challenge me? So that's number one is uh, kind of people in culture that we bring. And I think as people have interviewed with us uh, or come on board, I always sit down and say, was it what you expected? And they say it was even better than I expected, you know, kind of love it here. So I think I think the, the people in culture is big. I think the second thing is having really challenging work. And uh, we have really challenging things. The world is an analog world. And how do you capture that? And it's, uh, it's a challenge. So I think uh, engineers, they, they like those challenges. We're doing a lot around um, artificial intelligence and IoT, um, virtual reality I mentioned earlier. So some of the areas that are exciting for, for people. And then the third part, and one of the reasons that uh, I'm at Tech was the opportunity within Fortiv. So Fortiv is a Fortune 500 company. It's made up of about 20 other operating companies. And from career pathing, uh, we have promoted out of tech into other companies, probably 30 or 40 people every single year. They get to go become CFOs, presidents, uh, VPs of marketing, uh, different roles. So you can you can come into the the parent Fortive umbrella and build an entire career working in you know Tektronix, which is predominantly a uh, a hardware software type company. To we've got sister companies that are pure SaaS models. If if that's interesting to you, so that's a a lot of the um, intrigue. I think with people coming in is that there's a 
career path here that includes a wealth of other companies that you could work for in your career. Tammy, um, Tektronix is a division of Fortive, and I don't know that you actually break out revenue, but I'm assuming that Tektronix revenue is north of a billion dollars. So you're the president of a tech company that has a billion dollars of revenue, and you're a woman. My guess is I can count on less than two hands the number of female presidents of tech companies with revenue of that size. So how'd you do it? <laughs> uh, I had a lot of help along the way, a lot of uh, fantastic mentors and coaches. And, um, and I think picking roles that I enjoy. I always think you excel at things that you, you truly enjoy. I mentioned uh, uh, I liked sports. Um, I always played team sports. And I think when I got into the sales side, the business side, it became a sport to me. I love the scoreboard. Um, I like picking teams that want to work together, not necessarily one uh, superstar, but everybody makes the, the team better. And I think that's, you know, building good teams, having success has given me the opportunities to, to, do, to do this job and do things that I enjoy doing. I think you're a little bit too humble, Tammy, but okay, we'll accept that. But I'm gonna try this again. What advice, and I'm sure I'm not the only person to ask you this, what advice do you give to uh, women and people of color seeking mm -hmm. to enter a field that can be lucrative, um, yeah. but has created enormous obstacles for women and people of color to enter? Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I could be an advertisement for working in technology. I've had so much fun. It's always changing. Um, it's global, it's rewarding. You mentioned lucrative, uh, it is. Uh, so I think um, seek, seek out mentors and coaches. Um, I'm always open to that. I've got a network of, of people that if, if not me, uh, someone in my network that can be a coach or a mentor to you. And the other part, uh, Mark, the, as you called out, there's not a lot of people of color or women and uh, we want more. So opportunity exists. And I'd say, I'd say just go do it. It's, uh, it's been a, a fun and rewarding career. You're forever learning uh, every day. I'm looking something up on the internet to figure out like, what is this new technology? What's, what's happening here? So you, it never gets old. Well, but Tammy, let's talk a little bit about your climb through the corporate ranks. To, to what degree did you have to work harder because you were a woman? Did you have to prove yourself? Hmm. It, it, or maybe not at all. I mean, your mentors, at least in, in terms of me looking at your career track, you were working for men. Hmm. Work for both. Um, I've worked for both. I've had, um, I always say that, uh, you know, all, all the great women have probably had strong, strong fathers and strong support from men in the workplace. Um, and I, I ask that uh, all men, you know, support women and people of color because I think that that has to happen. If you just look at the percentages, that has to be a, a big part of it. So um, it never felt like I was working harder than others. I, do, I don't know if uh, if somebody was watching what they would say, but I always felt like uh, you think about the team. How do you make the team better? And then how does the team win? And if the if you make the team better and the team consistently wins year over year, then there'll be opportunity for everybody. And I've, uh, I've, I've jumped at those opportunities and I, and I love it, but there's, there's also a lot of people I've worked with that have been given similar opportunities and done really well. Tammy, we have um, a question from the audience, which I think is a good one. Um, the question is, as a global company, how does tech compete in markets like China while still protecting your innovations and your IP? Mm. Yeah, we've had a uh, large operation. It's actually our second largest uh, site is China. We have several hundred people there um, and um, all the same type of uh, intellectual property um, recognition that there is in, in the US and I, I'm actually super proud of, of the team in China, especially 
with the, we have manufacturing facility there that, that manufactures about 50% of the products that we ship around the globe. And, uh, you know, they've had as many challenges as we've had in our Beaverton facilities this year with the global pandemic. There's, as I, I think about how we've moved to this virtual work, um, there's a lot of jobs within Tektronix that cannot be done virtual. We build stuff and uh, people have to go into the office. People have to do work. And uh, the teams in China and Beaverton and in our Ohio facilities have continued to do that and, um, and be very innovative about how they do it. So, um, Tammy, another question. Uh, a, a, a viewer was intrigued by your um, notion of celebrating failure. Um, and the, the question was, uh, how do you create that kind of a learning environment in school? How do you mm. teach kids it's okay to fail? You know, mm. it's, you're a competitive athlete. I can't imagine your coach ever told you it was okay to fail. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a very it's a very good point. I think the way that we look at it, and I'm, I'm thinking if this applies to school, the the way we talk to the teams about it is there's a wealth of good ideas out there. Is this the one we want to spend time on? And if if we can sort of get this one off the boat, like we explore it, we realize it's either not for us, it's not, it's not big enough, it's not a big enough problem for the customer. We thought it was, but the customer's got bigger problems. We put that aside, we take those same individuals who have come to us and said, we think we should kill this. We take that same team and we let them go work the next big idea. So I think it would have to be, if I apply that to school, if you fail at something, how do you get rewarded with getting to work on something else or getting you know, the next learning? Um, it's not like they say they're gonna kill it and we say, well, you guys are, aren't good. Um, we say, awesome, we know we can trust you. You're gonna tell us when things aren't gonna work out. We wanna give you the next big opportunity to go explore. Um, thank you, Tammy. Someone asked, you got a degree at Syracuse in, what was it, uh, electrical engineering? I actually got two engineering degrees. I got an electrical engineering degree and a bioengineering degree. Okay, so the question was, how many women were, your, were in your classes? Not many, a handful. Big, big auditoriums with very few women. Well, that may be part of the answer. So. Um, yesterday, two things. One, I just got a text from someone who's watching this who said, Tammy's being too humble. I don't know if they know you. <laughs> um, secondly, uh, for those of you who haven't read, uh, Anthony Effinger, who will be on um, in this event talking to a couple of fascinating people, uh, wrote a wonderful short profile of you uh, in Willamette Week that was published earlier. And um, we got an email from the son of the founder of Tektronix that I think it's okay to read, um, mm -hmm. uh, Howard Vollum, who was along with Jack Murdoch, one of the two great Oregonians who founded Tektronix. Well, he, one of his sons, uh, Don, read the profile and I just thought it'd be worth reading. He said, uh, great story. Um, Anthony is absolutely right that my dad would have probably liked Tammy, who I have not met. My dad always thought of himself as an engineer first. A big part of his success was that he was his own best customer, which gave him a lot of insight into what other customers wanted. Um, so that's a nice thing to say. Is it, a, is it a problem that sometimes engineers don't have the capacity to think as customers because they're so inside their own head as engineers? I, I, I think anybody can fall into that trap. You know, I think if, if you think of some of the great companies that are no longer here and, and I spent 17 years in the networking industry. And the first 10 years, it, customers were going out of business or being gobbled up all over the place. And I think if you, uh, if you don't stay customer centric and keep reinventing yourself, you're going to be vulnerable to that. So I, I don't know if it's just engineers. I think, I think anybody in business can get caught up in being good at something and thinking that if you don't reinvent that you can just, you could just stay there. 
um, we can pick off lots of things. I'm, I'm a bicycle fan and you look at Peloton and what they've done, they've taken the world by, by storm, but they'll get disrupted if, uh, if they don't continue to reinvent themselves and they'll have to do that. And so I, I, again, I, I think it, I think we're all vulnerable to that and we've got to know that and we've got to continually disrupt and reinvent ourselves uh, to find the next best thing or, or somebody will do it to you. Jimmy, that is a great note on which to end and I'm getting the note that we're out of time. I really want to thank you for participating in TechFest. Um, we've innovated because this is virtual and it seemed to have gone off okay this morning. So yes. thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Mark. Enjoyed being here. Bye-bye.